Okay, so I'd like to welcome you to our today's web seminar on the plastic gears, including nonlinear materials in our uh, latest version of the FA Workbench, the FA Workbench 7.0. A few words to myself. I'm working in the FE part of the FA Workbench, and therefore I am the person uh, who is in charge today. And I would like to show you what our latest developments are in this topic. Our big goal is always to have a really efficient computation. This is important for us. And uh, the same importance has that the simulation needs to be reliable. So these are the two big goals that we are working on. And what is then essential for our calculations? Usually, if you talk about FE workbench, you're used to super fast analytical solutions that have been developed over decades within the FEA. And usually, our simulation times are, I would say, less than a second if it's a small thing, or let's say a few seconds. But here, what I'd like to present today uh, is a real FE calculation that is started from within FE Workbench. And here, we also did optimizations, but of course, full FE simulation is nothing that can be done within seconds. It would be nice, but actually, it's not the case, I guess, for none of us. So here, we are actually happy to have hours, but not days for the FE calculation. Uh, if you pay so much here, time or computational costs, uh, you get, of course, something. So you can use here nonlinear material, uh, which is, of course, interesting if you talk about plastic materials. And as it is obvious here on the picture on the right side, it is possible to have a gear body that is more complex than our standard calculations often use. So the detailedness is very high in what we're doing here. And this is what I'd like to show you. What is very important for plastic gears, we're used, but if we're coming from the, the steel materials, so we are used to a linear elastic material behavior. This is, as it is shown here, not the case for plastic materials. Usually, there's a decrease in the slope. So with increasing strain, the slope is getting down. So it's getting less stiff, the material. And also for different temperatures, uh, we have different stress strain curves. This should be considered when talking about plastic gears. And due to this reduced stiffness, so if you would talk about steel, the levels here would be way higher. Uh, of course, premature and late mesh are important issues to consider. So teeth come into contact that are usually not in contact. And also the Hirschen theory uh, might come to its end because the deformation gets too large. So it's essential to compute the contact in a deformed state. And last but not least, uh, if the wheel body gets more complex, it might be the case that if you compare nonlinear versus a linear uh, simulation having a quite complex wheel body, that your linear solution is, so to say, on the unsafe side. And it's really essential to have nonlinear computation. What we offer to tackle these um, requirements is a quasi static rolling simulation in which we consider the material and geometric nonlinearities. And here we're using Abacus. So far, we don't, well, we have not yet a FE module in the FE, which is capable of doing all these phenomena. So at the moment, we're using Abacus, but we hope here to, to switch to a Z, Z88, which we're used to very often when we talk about FE calculations. But at the moment, it's still Abacus. So what does our solution uh, include? We first need to get a mesh for our finite element computation. Here we rely for the teeth on what is provided by Stirak, our FE-based uh, linear uh, tooth contact analysis tool. 
From there, we know that it is a very good mesh that they can provide. It's hexahedral mesh parameterized, and it was also very good. All the modifications that we apply to our gear, they are included in this mesh. So we have a real representation, so to say a digital twin, uh, within our simulation of what you have uh, on your test rig, for example. The wheel body that is included might be of arbitrary complex shape. It is imported as a CID body. So what you construct can be imported and then afterwards combined with these teeth. It is positioned and meshed with our internal FEM measure. So I can make sure that it's cut at a radial direction such that it fits to the teeth that I have. And this is important because we don't want to have a gap between the gear body and the teeth, and there should be no overlap of material. So we bring the two gears and the potential wheel bodies. So you can use no CAD wheel body. You can use one or two wheel bodies um, made from CAD bodies. So this is up to you. Uh, we bring it together to a common coordinate system and we write the corresponding input file for the FE solver. This looks, for example, then like this. We prescribe all boundary and contact conditions. This is a question of efficiency. Of efficiency. If I can tell the FE solver these flanks will be probably in contact, then this is more efficient than if I would say the FE solver any surface might be in contact with any other, then this search algorithm is way more expensive. So here, all the optimization tricks are uh, in use. Next, we run the simulation itself. So we have many rolling positions that are analyzed. And for all, we can apply the corresponding material behavior. And after the simulation is done, we are back in the FA workbench for post-processing. So we have several quantities that are evaluated, uh, two on the flank, two in the root area, and the 3D uh, representation also allows to have a look at the meshes and how they are rolling. In the next step, I'd like to show you uh, what the input comprises. It is possible to account for the shaft deflections that come from our standard 1D shaft bearing gearing system. So this is a Timoshenko beam model and yeah, quite easy model, but for uh, having the shaft deflections computed, it is enough to do so. So this is very helpful to get correct boundary conditions. Uh, you can use this as boundary condition, you do not have to. You can also set the, uh, the inside of the wheel body stiff, so this is up to you. And if we have a look here on the right side, here's one example. I flip back and forth for a moment. We can see if we apply such a tilt around two axes, then the gears come into a slight different contact scenario, of course, which will be accounted for uh, during the computation. The boundary conditions, uh, except from these deflections, uh, can be seen here. We apply the moment that you give us uh, at the driven gear. And on the driving gear, we apply certain small angles, so increments. And this is, uh, so to say, the temporal discretization of our simulation. Um, the mesh, uh, I've already mentioned a little bit before, for the teeth, this is a hexahedral mesh. It is from, from Stirak, and from there it is well known that this hexahedral mesh is a good mesh for, for having the, the contact analysis. And in order to cope with the complexity that might come from your CD body, a tetrahedral mesh is favored for the wheel body. It can be either with linear tetrahedral elements or with quadratic tets. So this can be chosen uh, during the meshing process. After having created the input file, 
Uh, I will have a live demonstration uh, in the second part of today's web seminar. So there I will show you this in more detail, but here to get an overview. So after having written the input file, uh, the solver is started. And here you have two options. One option is everything is uh, everything runs automatically from within FE Workbench. So this means you just provide us that path where the abacus.bat file is located. This comes with the standard installation of, of Abacus. And what I also need is uh, the number of CPUs you would like to use. This is on the one hand side, dependent on the hardware that you have available, and also the number of tokens or licensing issue from Abacus, uh, which would you would like to specify here. If you do so, and click on uh, run the simulation, then it will run in the background. You won't notice anything from Abacus. And also when the post-processing starts, you won't notice that Abacus has been run. Uh, the other option that you have is if you have, for example, an external cluster, maybe a Linux cluster, wherever your Abacus simulation is usually run, you can also do this. So it is possible you give me here a folder where you'd like to have the input file written to. You uncheck here in this box where it says run FE solver. And what then happens is that only the input file is written, written to this folder. You go manually in this folder, take the input file, bring it to your cluster, run it there, because I guess the cluster is uh, more powerful than what your machine is, than the FA workbench is running on. And you can come back with the resulting ODP file. And so to say, you can split into two parts in the simulation. So when you have the ODP file available, you know, give me here the path to the ODP file, run the simulation for a second time. And in this case, uh, the ODP file is imported for post-processing and we outsourced the FE calculation by doing so. The post-processing can be done in two ways. One is again from within FE Workbench. We have created several diagrams in our reporting mechanism, which for example, uh, allow to have a look at flank pressures or in the tooth area, certain quantities, which we'll focus on on the next slide. And there are results available for each tooth root that is in the model. So if you have a look here, a model having, for example, three teeth, so it's not the full gear that is meshed because this would be too expensive. So just a few of them, as many as are necessary. So here the results for two tooth roots will be shown. And it's always the driving and the driven gear from which the results are available. The other option you can have, you have the ODP file available. So I guess if you have Abacus in house, you have also uh, corresponding FE experts. And if they are interested in, they can of course have a look uh, into the ODP file using their Abacus CAE. So here you have both options. This is for a very quick and good first overview. And if you then would like to have a detailed analysis, you can have a look in there manually. Now I'd like to uh, focus on the quantities that we extract. So usually the result data, is a huge amount of data that gets out of such simulation. Uh, last ODP file I had in hand was 11 gigabytes uh, large. So this is really a big amount of data and to extract data from there is very important because it's not trivial to get with a few views the most important uh, information. So here I'd like to show what we extract in the tooth root area. We take each tooth root, make it so to say flat, so we roll off it and can have a look on each tooth root rolled off, so tooth width over the rolled off um, length here. And this diagram we get for each rolling position, so for each time step. If we then have a look on one single node, 
and we trace it from time to time, we can extract such curves for each of the node. And by doing so, we have the chance to get the maximum and the minimum stress that this node feels during its uh, movement. And by including the mean stress sensitivity, DM, we can compute a damage equivalent uh, stress value to zero. In German, this would be the Schädigungs equivalent to Schwellspannung, uh, which gives a good hint of what happens in the tooth root area. Second quantity that uh, we show in the tooth root area is the strain. So for plastic materials, the strain might be larger than you're used to from steel materials. But it's important to have here a certain number not exceeded. So we again have here the tooth width over our rolled off tooth root area. What we then do is, so to say, projection over this yeah, mountain. We get all the maximum values for each tooth width coordinate. This is then the solution for one rolling position. And if we then summarize them and have all rolling positions after each other, we get here one big mountain that allows us to evaluate what does the strain over the full rollover uh, scenario. Mm -hmm. A very important question here is, which stress do we actually analyze? Usually stress in an FE simulation is stress tensor. So I have three by three quantities. And what usually engineer, engineers do here is they compute uh, uh, comparison stress using a comparison stress hypothesis. Or well known are the von Mises uh, plastic distortion hypothesis and the normal stress hypothesis which is uh, used commonly for brittle materials, whereas steel, which is ductile, uh, is usually uh, treated with the von Mises hypothesis. As plastic materials can have both uh, features, can be either brittle or ductile, or also something in between. Uh, we had a look at a FEA project, uh, which helped us here. And they proposed their shear strength factor for interpolation here. So the shear strength factor, which is uh, the shear strength over the tensile strength. So this quotient uh, is one for brittle materials and it's one over square root of three for ductile materials, approximately 0.577. And this F tau then enters this interpolation factor Q, which is here used for the uh, comparison stress calculation. So uh, the Q goes from zero to one, depending on the chosen F tau. And so we can directly interpolate from pure von Mises uh, comparison stress to a normal uh, uh, stress hypothesis, comparison stress. If we use now this computed stress, do the evaluation as shown before, so calculation, this damage equivalent uh, stress. And if we have now a look here on the diagram that results, we see over the tooth width and this developed tooth root geometry. So zero means this is the ground of the tooth root, a few millimeters left and right. And we get the corresponding stress. So this is here, then one tooth root, so to say, unrolled. And what is very interesting, this is something just common for all the diagrams that I will, will show. Uh, some information gets, so to say, lost. This information compression does here not allow to tell at which rolling position exactly a certain minimum or maximum value occurs. So this cannot be retrieved here from the diagram, but it's possible to tell where at which position a certain value occurs. If we compare this to the strain diagram, so here we plot the logarithmic strain that is directly comes from, from Abacus. We do the same uh, calculation uh, as shown before with the stresses. So the stress hypothesis is also applied to the strains in a similar way. 
And here we do a slight different uh, information compression. So here on the y-axis, the roll-off process is shown. So each horizontal line corresponds to one time step, one rolling position that is analyzed. And we can see here on the x-axis, the truth width. So we get each time the maximum value that exists for one tooth width coordinate at the certain point in time. So we lose the information where exactly here in the tooth root this happens. We only can tell at which width coordinate it happens and at what time it happens. So again here, the idea is let's compress the data so that you have a look what are your maximum values that are of relevance, when do they occur, but at the same time, we lose the exact position. Now, let's have a look at the flank. So I've shown the two values that are uh, retrieved from for the tooth root. Here, the flank maximum pressure is an interesting quantity, of course. So for each node, it is tracked what is the maximum flank pressure value directly taken from the contact that occurs at any point in time. So we have here, again, tooth width in X direction and the gear diameter in Y direction. So this is really a view on the flank if you have your gear in hand. And you can see which maximum values occur for which position. So here we lose the information when does this maximum value occur but we can see where it occurs and what it is its quantity. A second uh, way of yeah, showing more or less the same results is we now uh, lose the information at which diameter position uh, this result occurs, but here we can extract when does it occur, this maximum value. So here again, this is similar to what the strain for the tooth root is processed with is here horizontal line is one rolling position and we get each maximum value for the corresponding tooth width coordinate and it is then displayed here. So this is probably what you're more known to. This is here another way of yeah, compressing the data to get a good overview with uh, really one view on the results. What is again important or interesting for plastic gears is a wear indicator. It uh, computes the pressure times the sliding velocity. So the pressure we've seen before, now I multiply this just with the sliding velocity at this point for each node. Here we also had a look at uh, the FA project 8561, the and they proposed to have here the point that is in contact. We assume for a moment that the gear is stiff. So just for this few, for this few short, for a few milliseconds, the short time from one time step to another one, we rotate one and the second gear, and then this common point uh, gets to different positions. And the distance between these two points is the sliding distance. And if we divide the sliding distance by the time step size, so how long does it take to get from here to here? Then we have a good measure for the sliding velocity. And if we apply this and now multiply, the uh, so computed uh, sliding velocity with the pressure seen from on the slide before, we get diagrams like this. So here, this is a helical gear. Uh, and here, this line where it's zero is where the rolling point is. And going uh, more to the tip or to the root, uh, of course, the sliding again occurs. And this is here the multiplication of the pressure from the slide before times what we've computed here. And again, in this diagram, it's not possible to tell at which profile coordinate this uh, value occurs. 
you can tell at which point in time certain values occur and at which tooth width coordinate. Uh, now I'm through with my first part. I will uh, immediately switch to the FI workbench and I'd like to show you uh, several issues here uh, in the online demonstration. Of, uh, one point is of course how to uh, couple Abacus here, how to get the uniaxial tension test data into your model. What are the possibilities uh, to, to set up your model, uh, including the, the cut wheel body? The two options to start the simulation, including or not including the shaft deflections. And finally, post processing and having a few on the results. So let me switch. So here now I'm in the FA workbench. This might be a model as you have it available without any wheel body, very simple model. And now let me go through several points. One is how to connect Abacus. So we have here uh, under extras settings, a tab named Abacus Film Solver. As mentioned before, here I need to pass to the abacus.bat uh, file, number of CPUs and the folder, if you'd like to have your input file written to it, please specify it here. You can apply this. Next, I'd like to show you how to insert the test data. So if you're in the global database, there are uh, several tabs. One is data curve, and there I can insert a new one. So I give it some names, for example, only axial test data, create a new entry. Here I can either insert manually values or do a CSV import. I have a CSV file available. So I take here a stress strain curve. Uh, click here and finish, then the data is imported. We scroll down, we can have a look at the data. So it's your stress on the y-axis over strain on the x-axis. And we see this very common decrease in stiffness with increasing uh, strain values. So this looks what we expect to see here. So far it's only imported, but not yet in use for any of the gears. So we can have a look here in the model tree in our theoretical stage. We go to the calculation dynamic rollover with our environment. We have here two tabs. One is material data. That is, is what I will first uh, fill now. And here on top, the first is the material that we'd like to use. This is always in use for getting the Poisson number. And for the Young's modulus, we can either use linear elastic from material, and it will directly take the number that is in this material here, which is here listed in our materials that are within the model. Or if I'd like to use the stress strain curve that I've just imported, I can switch here to from stress strain curve and I can select this strain curve here. So it's the last one that I've included, my uniaxial test data, and they will be included here. You can see here, this is one side now with plastic material. Here on the other side, there's steel material. You can of course combine uh, however you'd like to. So you can have two also independent stress strain curves, you can have the same material on both sides. You can have plastic steel, you can have steel steel, uh, whatever you'd like to combine, this is possible for you here. The next two quantities that you see are the mean stress sensitivity and the shear strength factor. They do not directly enter the FE simulation. They are only relevant for the post-processing. So they are used to compute this damage equivalent stress there are need these two values. Then I'd like to switch to the second tab. Uh, the quantities that can be included here is the number of pitches. 
So how much of this gear should be rolled over is specified here. So for example, if you have some bores in here or some webs, it might be interesting to roll over, let's say three pitches, or it might also be interesting to run here over, let's say 90 degree or 180 degree of the gear. So this is specified here. And the number of rolling positions is, so to say, the subdivision of each pitch. And it's mostly important uh, because it influences how dense or not dense the diagrams uh, in reporting in the end are filled with data or not. If we go here to this uh, second block, um, there the number of elements can be chosen that are used for the simulation. Um, so this is the number of elements over tooth height. Uh, the at tooth root and in tooth thickness direction. The last one that is interesting is the number of elements across the common face width. And in general, one can say if you have here in the first three, a number of 10, it's quite coarse, number of 20, this indicates that they're in a converged regime. And here for the common face width, it's approximately a double the numbering. So 20 is quite coarse, 40 is usually quite fine. But of course, if you have a very broad, um, gear, very wide gear. It might not uh, be enough to have your 40, so this can also be increased. Let's say for so, uh, such standard gears, it is uh, possible to switch here to a converged mesh. So we did several analysis and uh, found quite good parameters. Um, then this part here is, is hidden and we set values here but you can also uh, define it on your own. So here it depends what you prefer. Then let's go to our model. So far there's no wheel body included. I'd like to show you how to include here a wheel body. So in the model tree via right click, it is possible to insert a corresponding wheel body. In the first moment, it's just empty. And our default massive wheel body, so it looks the same. No difference in computation so far. But here we have the option to switch to elastic from CAD file. And now we can start import a CAD body. And here, for example, is a CAD body. It's constructed in millimeters. That includes nine bores. So here, what is seen is the pure CAD body, and it's placed somewhere in the model. This really depends on where you sit or the set your coordinate system of your construction of your CAD body. And it's very unlikely that it matches the position of our gear in our model. But this is no problem. We can correct here the positioning quite easily. So if here are several steps that I'd like to go through with you. So we first uh, position the wheel body. If you have uh, in the past had a chance to, to use your workbench, uh, you will see that this procedure is always the same. Uh, we uh, prefer to have uh, select you three nodes on a curved surface. And if we compute the center, so we lie a circle uh, through here, and the center uh, of these three points will be aligned with the axis that is interesting for us. We can flip the direction. So if it's unsymmetric, this uh, CD body that you've included, uh, you can flip it that way so it fits. Next, ooh, I will align the whole thing in XL direction. So I click here on one node from which I know how far it is from the left or the right end of the gear. So here, uh, specified node distance will be equivalent to set here as zero. And I can see now it's aligned perfectly, this point that I've chosen on the body with my gear. If I would switch here to right, then I would see it's aligned on the other side. Here, my gear body is wider than my gear itself. So I can add here a axial offset, and then I can do the final positioning as I prefer it. 
for most cases, I guess it's fully okay to specify no certain alignment in circumferential direction. But if you'd like to do so, this is possible. So if you, if this is irrelevant for you, just click here, click finish, you're out, positioning is done. If you would like to specify this, then what you can do is uh, select here a node and you have now the option. So let me briefly hide this component. You have the option to set whatever you have clicked here, to set it exactly to the center of a tooth ground. So you can also add here some, some offset. Oops. So it's no longer perfectly centered. It's then gone a little bit left or right. And the one point version is interesting. If you have a certain point on your CFD body that is relevant for you that needs to be aligned uh, relative to this tooth cap. If you have, for example, a web, it might be interesting to have two points selected because then I choose the center point uh, for doing this alignment. And if I choose a third one, this is again my version for having a circle. I automatically compute the center of the circle and my helping line goes then through here again, wherever I would like to have it exactly positioned relative to the tooth space. I can click on finish and the model is placed there. Next, I would like to uh, mesh the whole thing. Yesterday was another web seminar that I can recommend because it focused on the wheel body. So I will just go over here quite fast. My colleague, Dr. Coyton, he explained in detail what happens here, uh, what you should pay attention to. So I need here to click on any surface that allows me to find the, the center. So if I would click on that surface or this one, this would be a problem. So always click on any surface that allows you to find here the center line. And uh, next step, the, the meshing is done. So I cut uh, the geometry in a radial direction. It takes a few seconds until this cut is done. And for our system calculations, uh, we include this here as a reduced stiffness matrix. So this is independent of our vector simulation. So a little bit material is used here, which represents the gears. So this goes up to the bending equivalent diameter. And we can mesh this now. And we can have a look here in the background what happens. So now the meshing is done and it's directly loaded here. And as mentioned, we can see the geometry goes up to the gears because in our system calculation, the gears are not included as, as real gears. So these are modeled as springs. And it's important that the gear body itself, the wheel body goes up to a certain height. Now the same geometry cut a little bit uh, further down uh, this is now 2.5 times normal module below the root circle diameter. This is the geometry that we will use for our FE calculations. So if we again here create a volume, we see that now it switches to the second representation. And this is what it looks like in our FE calculation. And also the 3D representation is nicer. That's why I decided to show you this version and not the other one. Uh, which is only used in the background for computing this reduced stiffness matrix. But as mentioned, more details. Please have a look on our website, uh, the presentation from my colleague yesterday. Then I would like to snap the coupling nodes. This is again very important for the FE version as well as for the Intel version. Click here on automatic determination of the coupling nodes. And we can see that if we hide for a moment the gearbox, the remaining parts, you can see here under the gear, the nodes are snapped. So these nodes are in the end coupled in the FE simulation to the gears on top. And on the inside, these are the nodes that are prescribed with the boundary condition. So either it is fixed 
or if you're interested in having the shaft deflections applied there, then the shaft deflections are applied. So we'll click here and finish. We could now calculate this reduced stiffness matrix. It is not necessary if you're only interested in the variant without the environment. So there are no shaft deflections applied. You can directly start here. Or the other option is having included the shaft deflections, then you need to run this fifth step that we've just seen. Then we have the reduced stiffness matrix available and it enters then the system calculation. And if you go here and gear unit system calculation, we have this calculations tree. There it is possible to check the dynamic rolling. So this is the second uh, way how to run it. And if you do this way, then the shaft deflections are included. If you're not interested, then this is the way to go. So I don't start this now because this will take several hours. We have a quite fine resolution here. So I skip this and will directly jump to the results. So I switch to second FE Workbench uh, installation. And here is the geometry that has been computed. And what uh, you can uh, have a look here is, this is more the, the qualitative uh, view on the whole thing, just to get an overview of whether everything happened, what you expected. This is here the FEM post-processor view. This is a uh, new development. It's uh, parallel to our just standard 3D model. And uh, you can open this while having here a click on this radical stage. Then there's this folder output of calculation modules. If it's missing, you can set this here via this checkbox show kernel output files, calculation kernel outputs. And then there's this folder dynamic rolling. And therein is this 3D FEM post processor file. If you click on it, then these results are loaded. Takes a few minutes especially for those uh, highly resolved models. And then you can have a look here. This is more not for, for real quantitative analysis. This is uh, for getting a nice overview. And if you'd like to have detailed analysis, you can use our uh, report template. So here the report template under overview reports, dynamic reports, dynamic rolling FEM uh, can be chosen. And uh, this is then what was computed, uh, that's prepared. And if we have now a look on those results, I can show this to you. What comes are these diagrams. So again, as mentioned, uh, some quantities on the flank. So this maximal flank pressure, gear diameter over gear width. And this other version where I ignore the gear diameter, so I only extract the maximum in uh, profile direction. But here you have the chance, as I already mentioned during my presentation, uh, at which point in time this is done. Uh, you've seen in the model before, three pitches were computed. So this is here the three pitches that you can see. And what is also interesting, the driving gear is uh, has more width than driven gear. So we aligned this such that these two are shifted as it is in the real model. So this helps to understand why it is here no contact. It's quite obvious because the other gear is not that wide. Then this uh, blank wear indicator is, is shown here. Here, this slider that allows to switch between the different flanks that are included in the model. Here, it's for the driving gear. Here, the same for the driven gear. So, all data that is relevant can be looked at. And next, we get to this tooth root uh, results. And here again, 
the slider, which allows to switch between the two of the routes. And this goes down here to the strain. So here, again, the quantities for the different uh, two of the routes. Okay, so I am through with my uh, model that I wanted to show you. So I'd like to get back to my presentation. And if there are any questions, please let me know. I hope I'll, uh, I can answer them. And if you're interested, uh, this is the last uh, seminar in our web uh, seminar series. Uh, several had already been before. Uh, they are uh, summarized and they can be found on our webpage. So please have a look there if something is interesting for you. And uh, if there are questions, uh, please let me know. You have the dashboard, you can ask their questions. Or alternatively, uh, you're invited to uh, come after the web seminar and, and write to us uh, via our support uh, ticket system. But there, I also can answer questions and ask my questions if I can, and ask my colleagues if I am not able to answer your questions. So, there we have many options. So, thank you for your attention.